over half a century, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration has been a fixture in science, in fiction, and in science fiction as well. Uh, the organization I'm talking about, of course, is NASA. But is NASA now at a crossroads? Well, who best to find out from than the administrator of NASA, Charles Bolden. Thank you very much. Thank you agreeing. very much. Thanks so much yes. for allowing me to be here. It's, uh, it's exciting for me to be here. Well, it's fantastic having you on uh, Talk to Al Jazeera. I know it's very rude to ask this of a guest, but my first question to you is, why are you here in the region? Oh, I appreciate you asking the question. I'm here in the region. Uh, it's sort of the first anniversary of President Barack Obama's uh, visit to Cairo and uh, his speech there when uh, he gave what has now become known as uh, Obama's Cairo Initiative, where he announced that he really wanted to, this to be a new beginning of the relationship between uh, the United States and the Muslim world. Uh, when I became the NASA Administrator, or before I became the NASA Administrator, he charged me with three things. One was he wanted me to help re-inspire children to want to get into science and math. He wanted me to expand our international relationships. And third, and perhaps foremost, he wanted me to find a way to reach out to the Muslim world and uh, engage much more with dominantly Muslim nations uh, to help them uh, feel good about uh, their historic contribution to science and engineering, science, math, and engineering. I mean, are you in a sort of diplomatic oh, role no, no, no. to win yeah. hearts and minds? No, in the not Muslim at all. Uh, it's not a diplomatic anything. What it is is it's trying to expand uh, our outreach so that we get more people who can contribute to the things that we do. The International Space Station is as great as it is because we have a conglomerate of about 15 plus nations who have contributed something to that partnership that has made it what it is today. Um, if it were not for the presence of the Russians, for example, um, we would not have the International Space Station in its form. If it were not for the Japanese and their incredible module Kibo, uh, that is perhaps the, uh, the best laboratory module on the International Space Station, it wouldn't be what it is today. So. It's an, it is a matter of trying to reach out and get the best of, uh, of all worlds, if you will. And there is much to be gained by, by drawing in uh, the contributions that are possible from the Muslim nation. Tell us about Constellation, the Constellation Project, and why it was shelved. The Constellation Project, as some people will know, was um, the project that, that was going to be the way that NASA and the United States were, go were going to go uh, to Mars, to deep space. Uh, when it was announced as a part of the vision for space exploration by former President Bush, uh, the vision was great. What happened was we did not get the funding that would, ha would have been required to support that vision. And what NASA did over time, over several years, was uh, de-scoped it, de-scoped it, de-scoped it until when I became the administrator, the Constellation program was essentially a lunar-focused program and we had no funds uh, in the budget for getting to the surface of the moon, so our, our uh, descent module was scrapped or put on the shelf, if you will. We had no surface system, so we were essentially just going to go to the moon but not be able to do anything. Uh, President Obama and I thought that what we really wanted to do was, was reinvigorate the vision because we think it's critical for humans to go beyond low Earth orbit, to get to deep space. And that means you go to uh, a variety of places. Yes, we'll go back to the lunar surface. Uh, we probably will not think about colonizing there because you don't have to. Uh, we'll go to asteroids because we need to understand their makeup. Uh, some of them can threaten Earth. The help family help of me Europe understand this. Is it more difficult to, to visit an asteroid than it is to visit the moon? It is more difficult to visit an asteroid for a, a couple of reasons. I'll give you the primary reason. Asteroids orbit uh, the sun. And uh, unlike our moon and other planets that we know very well what their orbit is, it's very well defined because humans have watched them for centuries. Uh, asteroids orbit our sun and we don't have a very good idea about what kind of orbit they're in or not. Uh, we, if we can get about a month or so observing an asteroid, I'm told by some of my experts, then we can make a very good guess at, at what kind of orbit it's in and we can make a guess of the trajectory that we would have to fly if we were going to intercept one or to rendezvous with one. The Japanese just did it uh, in the last few years and uh, we helped them bring uh, a module back that had, uh, we hope, touched down on an asteroid uh, and because we're hoping that they will find some data that will help us to characterize that particular asteroid. So asteroids are very difficult. It's, uh, we talk about it as if it's going to be a very, a very interesting and easy mission it's probably going to be one of the more difficult missions that we do. 
Well, the obvious cynical question would be if it's more difficult to visit an asteroid and observe an asteroid than it is the moon. If you're not visiting the moon and you're cutting funding for visiting the moon, what chance, what likelihood well, of we're ever actually, getting to that stage? You know, President Obama is actually adding funding to NASA. My budget for, my proposed budget for 2011 is about $6 billion over five years more than it was before. Um, I have put more money into development of, of technology, what we call technology development, than was in the NASA budget before because what had happened with the Constellation program is, is our technology development had, had atrophied to some extent. So we know where we want to go. We don't have all the capabilities to get there, and that's what we're trying to do. The other two areas that suffered that paid the bill for Constellation were science and aeronautics, and I mentioned to you uh, one of the first questions I asked my folk in the aeronautics mission directorate when I came in was, if I go to industry and ask them what they think of NASA, you know, what do they think of our value, what are they going to tell me? Um, I, I suspected the answer would be what I got. They were going to say they don't spend a lot of time with us because uh, we don't do the kinds of things we used to do. We don't put money into research and development very much anymore, and we were not putting a lot of money onto the college campuses the way that we did. And that was not just NASA. The United States had sort of turned away from basic research and development. We had turned away from technology development. We had become dependent on, uh, I guess, on what we got from other, from other nations to a great extent. And we're trying to, to restore our own ability to develop technologies that we will need to do uh, bold new things, like, like go beyond low Earth orbit. So why do you think you have so much opposition within Congress? Oh, I think we have opposition in Congress because it, it is such a dramatic change to most people. Um, we have been, you know, and, I, and you heard me say that Constellation uh, had a great, the program itself came from I, what I think was a great vision. Uh, it was a program, however, and a vision that was not funded. Um, it is easy for people to say, but we understand that program. We know where it was going. Uh, it's very difficult to go with two things, and uh, our budget is not opposed in, in majority for its content. Our budget is, is, is opposed mostly because of the cancellation of the Constellation program. And one other thing, the introduction of commercial capability to get humans to low Earth orbit. That is something that's hard for people to grasp. Uh, we do it all the time. You know, when I send a, a satellite to orbit today, it generally goes on a commercial launch system. Uh, but people don't, they don't grasp that as being the same as, uh, but we're not going to do the same thing for astronauts, are we? Uh, if we want to ensure that everything's going to be safe and everything is going to work, NASA has to do it. And I have to explain but, to people But I mean, that, outsourcing you know. to the commercial sector, wouldn't people worry that here you have um, taxpayers still funding it, yet now the interest is not NASA's interest, it's the interest of but these particular one of the, companies. One of the complaints about NASA through the years has been that um, we have become NASA-focused, that we have become NASA-centric, and we do things for NASA's interest. Um, I don't share that feeling, but that's something that I hear a lot from people from the outside. Uh, that's not good if people think that we fly missions to support NASA and the things we do. We do what we do to support, to make life better for humans on Earth. Uh, we do what we do to make life better for people no matter where they live. And I'll give again, the International Space Station is an incredible example. It, perhaps its best gift to, to humankind is this United Nations type uh, entity that orbits Earth 16 times every day with multiple crew members from multiple nations, with components from multiple nations uh, that operates without uh, warfare and rancor. Yeah, we disagree every once in a while, but we have a method by which we come to agreement on what we're going to do and how we're going to operate. That is, uh, that is perhaps the best gift that the International Space Station gives to the world today, to demonstrate to people that you don't have to be of like mind, you don't have to be from the same culture, but you can come together with a common mission uh, that will be very successful and, and make progress for humankind. So you're saying that it excites you rather than worries you that China, India, Japan, all these countries are, are pumping money into space exploration? Oh, that really excites me. Uh, and it excites President Obama. I, and, and I, you know, in his, um, in his message in Cairo, he talked about expanding our international outreach, expanding our international involvement. We're not going to go anywhere beyond low Earth orbit as a single entity. The United States can't do it. China can't do it. No single nation is going to go to a place like Mars uh, alone uh, for a number of reasons. 
the technologies that we need to get there are going to come from a variety of different nations who, who offer different specialties and different talents. Um, it's expensive. It is incredibly expensive to go to space. That, that's one of the things that Congress understands very well. Uh, and, and the American people understand very well uh, as, we, as we find well, out how much it really costs. Well, I'm, I'm going to ask you about yes. that uh, in a moment, but first we have yes. to take uh, a short break. Stay with us here on Talk to Al Jazeera. Welcome back to Talk to Al Jazeera. We're talking to Charles Bolden, the administrator of NASA. Uh, you mentioned uh, the American people understand what you're trying to do. You mentioned that you're quite excited that other nations are pumping resources into space uh, exploration. But at the crux of this, isn't there, and you must know this, isn't there the issue of American pride and the fact that many believe that the U.S. is uh, losing its leadership role in space and that might be worrying many American citizens. I, I think that that might very well be worrying many American citizens. As I tell people though, when I come from overseas um, having attended what we call a heads of agency meeting, which is the, the heads of the five entities that are responsible for operating the International Space Station, uh, they all make it very clear the importance of American leadership and they all make it very clear that they like uh, having the United States as the lead agency, having NASA as the lead agency for the, the International Space Station. And they all make it very clear that they want to go with us uh, beyond low Earth orbit on into deep space. So while the American public may be nervous and antsy, uh, the rest of the world thinks it's really important for us to do what we do. How far are we from the militarization of space and the prospect of wars either being launched from space or being fought within space? My hope is that we're a long way away from that. And um, one of the things that we do at NASA is we are devoted to the peaceful uses of space. In fact, there are UN conventions, there are lots of laws, uh, space laws that try to, to keep space from being militarized. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, the, the gift of the International Space Station is that it allows uh, former nations that were former th formerly the bitterest of enemies, the United States and the former uh, Soviet Union, now Russia, um, to come together for a common cause and a common mission uh, and do things that probably we would never it have imagined. Isn't the before. argument that that particular competition, the Cold War, was exactly what space exploration needed to give it that impetus, that push. Uh, there is know, no impetus uh, at the Some moment. people say that because some people feel you have to have an enemy uh, to accomplish anything. And I contend again, we have demonstrated time and time again that you don't have to have an enemy. What you need for competition is a goal to which many people are seeking to pursue. And uh, some people will be willing to come together in the pursuit of that goal. Others will choose to stay on the outside in pursuit. But that doesn't mean that the, that the competitor is an enemy. I, I look at it not much different than the World Cup right now. I don't think any of the teams that go to battle, uh, you know, on the pitch in, in the World Cup down in South Africa right now consider themselves enemies. But they do consider themselves fierce rivals and fierce competitors. And they will fight to the very end until the match is over and then they go drink beer together. Well they played golf on the moon, I hope they play football at some stage. Um, we, s we spoke about opposition to UN President Obama within Congress and this new vision that the two of you have for NASA. What about opposition from former NASA Administrator Michael Griffin? Because I've got a quote mm -hmm. from him, he says quote, the administration's new budget offers a plan to dismantle an ongoing program but offers no coherent replacement. No coherent replacement. That's uh, pretty strong words from him. Uh, and uh, Mike is, a, is still a very dear friend, to be quite honest. We have worked together for a number of years. I respect his opinion. Uh, I think he respects mine, and I just respectfully disagree with him. I think we have a very coherent plan. Uh, the plan brings in a lot more than was there before under Constellation, and the plan is one that includes not just uh, a lunar program, but it includes a lot of development of the technologies and the capabilities that are going to allow us to do the things that the vision for space exploration said America was going to do. It also means that we're going to rely on our international partners much more than before. We're going to put, do what we call putting them in the critical path, which means we're going to give them or trust them 
with responsibilities that they may not have been trusted with before. You were a Marine. I am a Marine. You are a Marine. Yes, I'm just retired. You were <laughs> but once a Marine, always a Marine. And it's more than just words. We could talk about that for a long time. You conducted fighter pilot missions. No, I was an attack pilot. And there's a subtle difference. In, in you know, the Viet Vietnam War? I did, a long time ago. Why did you become an astronaut after that? Uh, I became an astronaut, to be quite honest, um, because I was inspired by a young man from, from uh, outside of Columbia, South Carolina, very similar to me, a gentleman by the name of Ron, the, I always refer to him as the late, great Dr. Dr. Ron McNair. He, um, he perished on the Challenger in uh, January of 1986, but uh, shortly after becoming an astronaut, he, I met him, I was a test pilot, and he asked me if I was gonna apply for the space shuttle program. I told him, not on your life. And he looked at me and he said, why not? I said, I'd never get picked. And he said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. How do you know? If you don't try, how do you know you won't get selected? And so he kind of goaded me into applying, and I, and I applied. But it was also an opportunity for me uh, to give something back to a nation that has been incredibly uh, kind to me, has allowed me to do things that, that I never dreamed of. So as a Marine who became an astronaut, been to space four times? Yes. After this diverting of funding, changing of funding, Constellation Project being scrapped. Do you feel that if you were 30 years younger or 20 years younger and you were a young aspiring astronaut, you would have taken the same path given NASA is doing what oh, it's doing You mean now? if I were an astronaut, would I support what I'm doing right now? If I were an active astronaut getting ready to fly Or somebody who wanted to become an astronaut. Uh, oh, if I were somebody who wanted to become an astronaut, I would be enthusiastic as when I go out and talk to kids on college campuses or those who are even in high school who understand, really follow the space program, the vast majority of them, this is a generational thing, the vast majority of young people are really excited about where we're going. And I get emails, I get letters, I get things from them saying, you know, thank you, uh, because they do not want to stay strapped in low Earth orbit. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, in, it's really necessary but they want to go where I wanted to go when I came to the space program. When I finally applied and I was selected, I actually thought that I would fly a couple of space shuttle missions and then I'd go off and train to go to the moon. And that before I, before I left being an active astronaut, I would be a person who would go back to the moon. Uh, and I still think that may have happened had it not been for the Challenger accident. So, so for me, you know, my dream has been deferred. I will never be, probably, uh, I won't say never, uh, I probably will not go to the moon or go to Mars, but my granddaughters will. Uh, and they will because of what President Obama and I are trying to do right now. We're trying to put a program in place uh, that will be properly funded, that will allow the United States to lead a group of nations uh, on a quest that humankind has sought since, uh, since we can remember. Uh, since even before there was an airplane, you know, Jules Verne had written stuff and people dreamed of going to space and doing things. So. It's something in the human DNA, and, uh, and I'm hoping that I can enable my granddaughters to, to go beyond that mountain or go to the other side of that river, or in this particular case, go beyond the other side of the sea that we call space uh, and get to a place where people have never been before. Something that's also within the human DNA seems to be fear. Fear uh, is very important. The recent <laughs> reports about yes. possible solar flares in 2013 hitting uh, the Earth. I'm assuming NASA would uh, know best about it. And of course, I mean, it's, it's a year late for those calling for Armageddon in 2012. But I mean, well, yeah. what's the possibility of the Earth being hit by anything? You and I saw the same thing, uh, I think, about the, one of the projections from one of my heliophysicists. Uh, we know that there are solar flares and they occur randomly. We now, because of some of the instruments that we have, most recently the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which we launched in January, we now can make much better predictions about space weather, which includes solar flares. So we know that there is going to be a violent solar flare at some point in the future. Uh, I think what you and I read was perhaps a projection that says we may, we may be able to narrow it to some period of time. And I, and I don't know, and I, I, would, I haven't finished reading the article yet. There is concern. I have concern about what we call near-Earth objects, asteroids, other things impacting Earth and having a detrimental uh, effect on Earth. Our Congress believes that, and so in the last few NASA authorizations, uh, we have been instructed but that by 2020, we have to identify 90% of those near-Earth objects that are potentially threatening to Earth. 
and we have to characterize them. Now, I can't, I've told Congress I won't be able to fulfill that entire thing. We can identify perhaps 90% of big objects. Mm -hmm. There are some smaller objects that can do, also do damage, and we probably won't be able to identify them by 2020. But we're making an effort. One of the reasons we want to go to an asteroid, and one of the reasons that we put going to an asteroid in front of going to Mars is because Mars is, does not threaten Earth. Ast a potential asteroid coming toward Earth does threaten this planet. And so I would like to be able to get a robotic mission to an asteroid as quickly as possible to be able to, to determine what's it made of. Is it sand or is it metal? If it's sand, we're not really worried that much about it because it's probably going to impact Earth and, you know, go away. Metal would uh, be a bad day. We could have another ice age, and, uh, and instead of the extinction of the dinosaurs, it would be the extinction of you and me, and I'm not real happy about that. Final question. Yes. You've been to space four times. Yes. You're the administrator of NASA. Yes. Is there anything out there except us? I don't know. Uh, NASA has spent incredible resources over time, over years, over decades, um, trying to find out whether there are other life forms in our, in our universe. Uh, you know, we ping a signal out all the time, waiting for somebody to answer, and so far nobody's answered. Uh, on every one of my four space shuttle missions, although I knew that it was very unlikely that I was going to see any evidence yeah. of any other life form, I looked. You did? Uh, I did. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm no different than, than the little kid, uh, you know, who wants to see an alien. My faith tells me that there is a very, very good possibility that there is, um, but I have no evidence. Charles Bolden, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Over half a century, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration has been a fixture in science, in fiction, and in science fiction as well. Uh, the organization I'm talking about, of course, is NASA. But is NASA now at a crossroads? Well, who best to find out from than the administrator of NASA, Charles Bolden. Thank you very much. Thank Paul you Green. very much. Thanks so much yes. for allowing me to be here. It's, uh, it's exciting for me to be here. Well, it's fantastic having you on uh, Talk to Al Jazeera. I know it's very rude to ask this of a guest, but my first question to you is, why are you here in the region? Oh, I appreciate you asking the question. I'm here in the region. Uh, it's sort of the first anniversary of President Barack Obama's uh, visit to Cairo and uh, his speech there when uh, he gave what has now become known as uh, Obama's Cairo Initiative, where he announced that he really wanted to, this to be a new beginning of the relationship between uh, the United States and the Muslim world. Uh, when I became the NASA Administrator, or before I became the NASA Administrator, he charged me with three things. One was he wanted me to help re-inspire children to want to get into science and math. He wanted me to expand our international relationships. And third and perhaps foremost, he wanted me to find a way to reach out to the Muslim world and uh, engage much more with dominantly Muslim nations uh, to help them uh, feel good about uh, their historic contribution to science and engineering, science and math and engineering. I mean, are you in a sort of diplomatic oh, role no, no, no. to win uh, hearts and minds? No, of the not at all. Uh, it's not a diplomatic anything. What it is is it's trying to expand uh, our outreach so that we get more people who can contribute to the things that we do. The International Space Station is as great as it is because we have a conglomerate of about 15 plus nations who have contributed something to that partnership that has made it what it is today. Um, if it were not for the presence of the Russians, for example, um, we would not have the International Space Station in its form. If it were not for the Japanese and their incredible module Kibo, uh, that is perhaps the, uh, the best laboratory module on the International Space Station, it wouldn't be what it is today. So, it's an, it is a matter of trying to reach out and get the best of, uh, of all worlds, if you will. And there is much to be gained by, by drawing in uh, the contributions that are possible from the Muslim nation. Tell us about Constellation, the Constellation project and why it was